The emergence of COVID-19 has forced the legal industry to rapidly undergo a fundamental transformation. I'm Jack Newton, CEO and co-founder of Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal software provider. In each episode of Daily Matters, we'll explore what this new normal means for law firms, how legal professionals can find success while working remotely, and how lawyers can best serve their clients during this unprecedented situation. Today, I'm here with Dan Lear, Chief Instigator of Right Brain Law and Team Member Marketing and Partnerships at Gravity Legal. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, Jack. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So, Dan, first, I'd, I'd love to know, how are you and your family doing? Um, there are so many ways to answer that question. Uh, I think I know that you have, you've got three kids. I've got right? three kids. Yeah, yeah, I've got three kids as well. I think yours, mine are 12, or sorry, 14, 12, skipped one almost, 14, 12, and nine. I think yours are a little younger than that, Just right? a little bit, you're right, though. Mine are mine are 11, uh, 10, just about turning 10, and uh, and seven. So so yeah, yeah, a little bit behind you, but... Uh, but not far, yeah. We've got pretty busy houses, I think. <laughs> so, I mean, like, and, and I won't bore non-parental listeners with uh, the chaos that is our home, because it's always chaotic whether or not there's a quarantine. But it, th- that alone, just the sort of added element of complete disruption to our daily schedules. Um, yeah, there's one speaking, of them right there. In fact. You. Speaking of which. <laughs> this is my son, Ian. Um, That's Aaron amazing. Levine asked me on Twitter over the weekend to have one of my kids do uh, an inappropriate entrance on the podcast. And, Cameo. Uh, Ian is uh, fitting the bill. Hey, Ian. There you go. You are on TV. So yeah, it's crazy having a family uh, out of school and with your entire sort of life and schedule and all of the best laid disorganized plans thrown into complete chaos. Um, but overall, I think everybody's healthy. Uh, my extended family so far, knock on wood, is healthy. Uh, so it's hard to it's hard to complain. You and yours doing well? Yeah, everyone's uh, everyone's healthy uh, and counting ourselves uh, lucky in that regard right now. So yeah, all things considered, things are well. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy time. I I sort of don't. It's weird when you joined. You said, "How are you doing?" And I I found myself answering this same question in this same way. All doing doing well, all things considered, right? G- yeah. Given that there's a pandemic going on, right? Um, yeah. And and I don't know. It, it seems weird just because it's something at least I personally, and I don't think our generation really has even lived through. So this no. experience is, is I, the word that just keeps coming to mind for me is very surreal. Yeah. It, it, it was kind of like a trip. Yeah. For the first week or so, I, I, I woke up in the morning and you had that feeling. Sometimes, you know, you wake up on a a trip, you know, overseas. It t- takes you a while to realize that you're far away from your own bed. And I had the same kind of feeling with this crisis where, you know, just waking up and then realizing like we're in the middle of this unbelievable pandemic and the world is has changed. And I, I heard an interesting comment, you know, the other day, which was there's no one alive that has lived through this kind of uh, world event and crisis. You know, even if you look back at, you know, 2008, even if you look back at, at 9-11, these are events that had, you know, immediate and clear ramifications, but this clear path of what some return to normalcy looked like. And it took yep. years to get there, but we got there. And I think what's what's so maybe discomforting about the current climate is we just don't know if and when things return to normal. We don't know if this shelter in place, uh, it, well, m- maybe shifting gears a little bit just to to your your wider context, Dan. I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, tell us where you're based and what what kind of uh, orders are in force uh, yeah. in, in Seattle right now. Yep. So based in Seattle, Washington. And we were one of the early states to have the the coronavirus and to have diagnosed cases of COVID. So, but we, I think we were one of the later ones to implement more rigid kind of uh, shelter in place, lockdown type yeah. things. So we came after California and after New York. Right now we do have an active shelter in place kind of lockdown situation, which is also, again, this is not a podcast about that, but it's also sort of odd because I, and I've joked with friends as, as now that there's literally almost nothing else to do, there are way more people walking around, way more people in parks. Uh, I see my neighbors way more often. Uh, so it is this weird 
kind of a situation where we're mostly just hunkering down, but because you can't go really do anything, you end up, you know, walking around a lot and, you know, going to visit neighbors, of course, at a distance a lot. Um, but yeah, my kids have been out of school since the 11th of March. It's looking like early May before they go back. Lots of homeschool. It's, it's, it's a weird time. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And what, what do you find thinking about the most? What's on your mind right now? Uh, oh, I mean, that's, I know that's a weighty so question, hard. but <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't want <laughs> I don't want to sound insensitive either. Um, I mean, one of the things, again, as we've been chatting, one of the things that I think that really strikes me about all of this, and and obviously unintentionally pitching Cleo, but really, I think one of the fascinating things for me is how many of us, now again, the economic consequences of all this are still very unclear, but how many of us have been able to sort of take what we do every day and really bring that home and and keep keep on keeping on. Um, yep. Yep. I don't know that even five, certainly 10 years ago, the, the type of kind of connectivity that we have, the type of work that we're able to do would have been possible. No. Um, and I know there are still a lot of people out there, you know, folks who work for, uh, restaurants or dentists, right. Uh, who, who are not deemed sort of necessary services who, who are in a world of hurt, but I am still fascinated by. And I, I think there's probably papers to be written and social scientists and other PhDs kind of watching as we basically shut down one portion of the economy, how much of it has continued and how much of it kind of keeps going on. And so that, I mean, that's just one of the more fascinating things. Again, I was also thinking just about the pandemic, as you mentioned. I think one of the interesting interesting things about this particular situation is it's happening in a world where we're way more connected than we ever were before. Um, so to just plug, um, one of my favorite people that I've been following sort of for, for valuable and compelling information on this, I'm a big Nate Silver fan. Yeah. So I'm literally, I literally find myself kind of checking his Twitter feed two or three times a day and going to his website, 538, because I feel like he's got the right combination of sort of skepticism about his own intelligence, but also sort of the quantitative chops to like bring some really thoughtful, um, assessment to what's happening uh, today. And so, uh, I, I, you know, just watching this unfold as a statistical um, matter is also fairly interesting. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many other things. i happy to launch into a discussion too about sort of my broader thoughts about the legal s- sector as well. But I don't, you know, yeah. there, well, what, there's what, so many what layers of what's going that, on here. You know, you, you know in, in terms of, you know, the, the impacts, I, I think you're right. You know, the there's many professions uh, and many aspects of our lives that have been forced to operate in a completely new way since this crisis emerged. And uh, you know, at Clio, for example, uh, on March 13th, I told the company, Friday, March 13th, uh, I told the company, we are mandatory work from home as of Monday. And you, the offices will be shut down. You will not be able to go in the office even if you wanted to. Uh, so get ready for for working from home on Monday, and and we're helping equip everyone with laptops and the other kind of essentials to get work done. Work done, you know, from home over the over the weekend. At, much of the company already had laptops, who were in good shape. But I was really amazed at the end of day Monday. Looking back at that first day, we didn't miss a beat. And if you'd asked me before, hey Jack, we need to migrate the entire company to a work from home environment. I would have thought that would be a months long planning and uh, forecasting and um, equipping scenario. And we did it, you know, over essentially overnight. And I, for me, it's been a huge learning experience just seeing how quickly people can adapt. And my kids this week are, are going into remote schooling where are the school is going to start doing classes over Zoom and, and start deploying textbooks, uh, you know, via, via, or uh, sorry, textbook based learning via Zoom. And it's going to be, it's going to be super interesting. And I, I just wonder about the, what permanent changes are we going to see in all aspects of society where maybe we would have never gotten to this point if there wasn't a forcing okay. factor and a catalyst to get us there. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, through your lens, where do you see that happening in other places in the world? And, and in particular, I'm curious, what do you see happening in in legal and 
you know, maybe you can give our listeners that don't already know you, you know, extensive background in legal, some of the uh, some of the work you've done, you know, both at uh, at Avo and beyond, and would love to hear you just reflect on on what you think those those impacts might be. Yeah, uh, big question. I may miss some pieces. Uh, let me. I'll see if I can start with the impacts first, and then I'll maybe talk about myself a little bit. Maybe I should do it the other way, but I won't. Uh, I mean, I think one of the really interesting pieces Bob Ambrogi's been been blogging about this now is sort of, and we've seen a lot on Twitter too about how really overnight a lot of law firms have had to figure out how to run a distributed cloud-based yep. uh, law firm. And uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to see whose businesses are set up to be that robust. Um, I think that, you know, just, just like, just, you know, keying off of your example of on Friday, we came into the office and on Monday we didn't right? And how quickly you can turn on a dime, how flexible your employees are, how nimble your systems are. Um, all of that is going to be, I think, really fascinating. And there are some broader implications as well. I'll put those to the side. So for folks who don't know me, uh, I currently, as you said, I've been doing some uh, independent consulting for legal technology companies. Increasingly, I'm getting involved with a company called uh, Gravity Legal which is a division for now, at least, of the uh, well-known uh, payment processing company based in Seattle called Gravity Payments. And we're focused on bringing financial technology tools and uh, payment processing to legal, which, to be fair, already exists. But we think there are some really interesting opportunities there. Uh, before my independent consulting, I did outreach and evangelism for the online legal marketplace, Avo, based here in Seattle. Um, and then before that, I was a technology attorney. I got my start in tech, actually. I worked as a paralegal during law school at Microsoft. And this is to the extent that I have cloud chops. I know I'm on a, I'm on a call with people who have far better <laughs> cloud chops than I do. But I, I like to brag that uh, some of the earliest, uh, well, they weren't some of the earliest deals that I did, although I was involved in some fairly early deals, kind of setting up the contracts and negotiating from the back. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that I was on the front lines. Some of the early deals for what became Office 365. Uh, and so the notion kind of of thinking about uptime and thinking about how we were as the outside counsel, the, the legal means by which we helped some of Microsoft's early cloud-based Office 365 customers mi migrate to the, cl to the cloud uh, was super interesting. Again, I wouldn't I wouldn't profess to know it the way you folks do, but uh, I did. I did do that, and and also it's it really is kind of in the air here in Seattle, where we've got Amazon with Amazon Web Services now a, a pretty big and growing uh, Google presence here as well. Yeah. So thinking about those things, it's just it's just kind of in the ether, ether if you will. But uh, that's my that's my background, and and just uh, super. I, I, I think that the driving and animating force for me is um, I'm just, I'm really fascinated and I'm really bullish on the power of technology to both uh, improve the legal sector and make it more efficient, more effective, but also really help lawyers do their jobs better, do more of what they like doing, leverage those very valuable and highly trained resources to their greatest extent. And so that's, that's me in a hopefully relatively smallish nutshell. No, it is it's super useful nutshell. And you've got a, a breadth and depth of experience to, I think, speak from a really useful perspective on on these questions. And to, to the to the earlier question that you uh, you started talking about the maybe this overnight demand that is being placed on law firms, which is you now need to be able to work in the cloud and you need to be able to work as a distributed law firm. And I actually think those are two very separate. That's an interesting observation. Yeah, two separate things, right? And yeah. I think many law firms I've worked with over my time at, at Clio, for example, are on-premise bricks and mortar law firms that maybe move their on-prem tech to the cloud, but the rest of their law firm keeps running the way it always did. You know, right. and I think this move to distributed work is going to be challenging for even law firms that are already in the cloud. And I think law firms that have neither cloud-based tools nor muscle 
in working in a distributed way, which which I believe is the vast majority of law firms in the U.S., which I know to be the vast majority of law firms in the U.S., are going to be facing a really significant hurdle. So my, my question to you, Dan, is are law firms in general, you know, up to the challenge and, and how do you think they should best navigate this, this crisis? Because I think there's, there's a lot of law firms listening to today's podcast that know that, Hey, Trump just said the shelter from uh, shelter in place is going to be extended through to April. Uh, Many of us, I think, believe that it's going to last far beyond that. It's clear that we're in this for a while now and just, uh, just, business as usual is not going to work. It might've worked for two weeks, but law firms that don't want to be profoundly and negatively impacted by this crisis need to be thinking about how they pivot quickly. Uh, so would love for you to respond to that question in terms of, you know, what can law firms do to step up to the challenge? And do you think, what do you think is going to separate the winners from the losers in this in this crisis? Yeah, I mean, the most obvious but super cynical and unhelpful answer is go cloud five years ago. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, that's not going to help. <laughs> that's not going to help you today. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm going to I'm going to come at this answer from a little bit of a different direction. And I hope that it if I don't get to it and you want to pin me down on specifics. Sure. By all means. But I keep thinking back. So I had, I've had kind of a lengthy career transition getting to the place where I am and a place that I really enjoy. I still have so much to learn and so much I want to do. But I've, one of the things that I'm most proud of about my career is that I've sort of carved out a space in the world where I feel like I fit and where I feel like I have an impact and where I get to sort of do the things that I do well. And it's taken me a long time to get there. And this is all leading up to something. This isn't just some kind of bloviating um, self congratulating story. (laughs) Um, But I, 10 years ago, um, or even 12 years ago, sort of in in the last, I think, big, big sort of crisis that our generation remembers, I was really in a place where I was just, I was really blown back. I was, I was on my heels. I was not ready. I, I was like, oh, and this was right on the heels of actually me graduating from law school you know, just felt like it was unfair that my generation sort of was being thrown into this as a little melodramatic, but like just not, not ready. And, and so to answer your question and where, and, you know, to answer one of your earlier questions, which is like, where are my thoughts today? And first of all, I want to be clear. My thoughts mostly go out to, to so many people who are suffering, so many people who are struggling. This is a, a, a terrible time, whether it be kind of from, from folks who are struggling with medical issues or family members who are, or, or economically, like I don't, I don't want to sound insensitive at all. And I want to, I want to put that out there first, but, but where my mind keeps going is like, if I had been, and when did, did when did you start Clio? 2010? 2008. Okay. So that, yeah, and that's so exactly we, my point, so, right? Oh no, go yeah, ahead. Go, go. Well, I, I was, I was going to guess what your point is, but I, I, uh, yeah, I'm going to so, let you so, make it, then I'll respond to yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then and then you can sound really smart by reaffirming what I've said, or vice versa. I can but, sound smart. Well, we can go. I can go first. Uh, you know, I I, I think no. is 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 a, a bit of grit. It you know in in your DNA is that what you're you're, you're well, commenting and, on? And, and and I, if I had had my head on straight ten or twelve years ago, I would have seen a world of opportunity in front of me. As I imagine, despite the world sort of falling down around you in two thousand eight, you saw as well. I did. And, and so like, I, and it's hard. It's really hard as like so much chaos is swirling around you to be like, I'm going to put my blinders on and I'm going to sort of yeah. march forward. I had a lot of conversations because I have this vision. starting a company in 2008 uh, that were basically me responding to the question, are you insane? Totally. Yeah. Totally. And but I, I saw with such clarity what the opportunity was that I needed to go after it and would, uh, you know, another Amazonian, uh, you know, there in your backyard, Jeff Bezos talks about his uh, regret minimization framework, which is what, one of the concepts I love. And through yeah. your life, you should try to minimize the things you'll regret. And I knew I would regret, even though there was a ton of risk in the midst of a, you know, enormous economic downturn that uh, things could go badly, that I would kick myself not to run after the opportunities that were clearly opening up for, uh, for the cloud and, you know, and, and in legal. And I think like then there's an enormous amount of opportunity out there for the people that can 
uh, can navigate this uncertainty and create clarity out of out of all the noise that's out there. And just to play with this idea for a minute, right? Like, if not 2008, if not right now, when? Right? Yeah. Because y- you'll never you'll never feel like it's safe enough. You'll never feel like it's clear enough. Right? That moment of clarity comes when it comes and you have to sort of jump on it. And, and so to sort, sorry, but to steer it sort of back to your question, I, I think that law firms should take this as an opportunity if they, if they're not prepared. And even if they are, and they're still struggling, like there, I, you know, if it's, whether it's your example, whether it's so many other examples of companies, whether it's me sort of saying like, and I get where I was going to finish my conversation, which is exactly where we were going, which is I really didn't get my head on sort of straight as far as the things that I thought were fascinating about this intersection of technology and law until really 2013 or 2014. And that was when I, I got my job at Avo 20, in 2014, but I'd been kind of playing in this space for about a year prior to that. And if I had had my head on straight five years before that, what kinds of opportunities could have been open to me? Right. And so I, I just, again, whether it's your example, whether it's sort of this story that I've shared, I want to encourage lawyers to the extent that they can and law firms to to look for the opportunities in this space. And I'll just give one small example. I won't give details, but I've been helping a client on one project. And uh, I would have thought that the particular thing we were we were pursuing was just, you know, a, a dead as a result of, of this and nonetheless, even sort of despite my own sort of fears, I kept sort of just pushing and asking questions and a really interesting opportunity kind of opened up just in the last kind of 10 days that I think, frankly, the folks that I was talking to, I was kind of pitching this idea to some outside folks. I don't think they would have been open to it. They probably wouldn't have even taken my call before the middle of March. But now because everything's changed, I was able to throw something at them that I kind of thought of that they were open to because of what's happening. Right. And and so I, I would sort of encourage lawyers and law firms, and again, I can get more specific if we want, but to to really kind of use this as, you know, whether you want to be really kind of hipstery, like as a design thinking exercise where you're putting some intentional constraints on yourself or, a, you know, a stretch goal or whatever it is, like how can you stretch or change or adapt your law firm in these really interesting constraints to to act and be and do things differently. And then second, I do believe this and I'll, I'll give a hat tip. I've been listening to uh, R. John Robbins, who's been doing a, a weekly thing on kind of, he calls it his uh, growth symposium. And folks have varying opinions about R. John. I think he's got a really interesting voice, um, but he's been just pounding this notion of like, there is opportunity out there. There is opportunity out there. And I, 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 maybe it's just an, it's a mindset thing too, but like, I just choose to view, like I can decide that I, I, I just want to sort of huddle up and, and hide and, and not go for these opportunities yeah. or I can try to push forward and try to try to look for them. And again, I, that's a very high level, wide range of conversation. I'm happy to give some specifics too, but I, I think it's as much about how you think about this problem as it is about what specifically you do. Yeah, I I think the the growth versus fixed mindsets are really important thing totally. for for lawyers to to think about in in this kind of a cl- uh, climate and and again one of the my favorite people to to quote these days is 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 Darwin and just the concept that the adaptability of the species is what lets it survive and and thrive and I do think that um, you know lawyers ever, should realize that every major economic downturn we've had has had winners and losers. There's, there's firms and companies of all stripes that emerge from these crises stronger than when they went in. And I think for, for them, it's thinking about what do I do to pull apart from the pack and what, what things do I execute on that create opportunity for me? So I'd love, you know, you, you made the offer and I'd love to, to take you up on it and spend some time on it. Um, what are the things that you see as, as, as big opportunities for law firms? If you just even talked about as, uh, you know, broad categories of things they could be investing in or working on, um, and would love for you to, if, if it applies, to layer in some of your experience at 
at Avon how thinking about the client experience and connecting with with clients can can help with that. But if if you were a solo or a small firm thrust into the COVID nineteen crisis, what would you be doing right now and executing on as the the opportunities for your firm? And your starting point was you were an average firm, you know, using on prem technology. Uh, and and probably not a ton of experience in working in a distributed and certainly not a work from home environment. Yeah, it's a great question. So many directions I can take it. I'll, again, I'll try to get specific, but feel free to nail me down. Um, so, I mean, the first question is: <laughs> No one's in the office. So, what are you going to do, right? So, you got to figure out your cloud strategy or your dis- distributed strategy if we want to pull them apart uh, really quickly. Uh, and maybe that means you, because you're you're probably, if you're a lawyer, you're probably going to feel a little uncomfortable sending an employee into the office to scan everything. But you know, you as the as the partner can assume that risk, right? Right. If they get sick and then they sue you. Like again, I know you're risk averse, <laughs> but somebody's got to go and start scanning whatever documents you need so that they can be accessible. You know. Uh, not, not what we, again, I, I don't know what your dependencies are, but like whatever it is that you need that's in the office, that's got to get to a place where everyone can get at it at a regular, in a, you know, if there's content, right? Mail, whatever that is, that's got to be solved, right? So that's the, I think that's the first step is like anything physical in the office that needs to be extracted and used by everyone, that's got to be put somewhere. Uh, if, if you've got, um, if you've got law books or other types of resources that you use on a regular basis, that are that you don't have a subscription to Westlaw, Lexis, Ross, Case Text, whatever it is, like those have got to be. You got to figure out how to get access to those, and you got to do that quickly. Um, I think the next question is you've got to get trained on, uh, you know, ideally cloud based or whatever it is, whatever software you're going to use. It's going to allow you to collaborate and share information um, with your firm. Uh, again, be that Clio, be that Office 365, be that the Google suite, whatever that is, yep. you got to figure that out real quick. Um, you got to figure telephony out. You got to figure fax out. Uh, if that's a big part, you got to figure out the, the mail, right? I did talk to, I think a firm or a business in this past week. Who's like, well, we've got one person going into the office and like, they're just going in once a day to like pick up the mail. Like that's a thing, right? You got to figure that out. Um, I think another super interesting and this, this sort of reflects on the darker side of humanity. So I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but like, like if you have a, a, a storefront office, do you board up the windows? Like, yeah, you know, like that's, I, I'm just like, I've seen a few here in Seattle. I was talking to a fellow in LA who's seen some stores boarded up uh, in his neighborhood. Like, and this is not in like a dicey neighborhood. He's no, actually I, I've, like I've, I've actually I was reading an article uh, just over the weekend that was talking about the break and enter rates in businesses has gone through the roof right, uh, in the crisis. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I feel like on-prem systems, especially, are more vulnerable than they've ever been because uh, you've got all sorts of assumptions about what your physical security would be that probably just went out the window two weeks ago. And and <laughs> I had a I had somebody break into my car actually last summer and steal like my briefcase, which like had my entire li- life in it, like checkbooks, like, I mean, everything, oh, which, no. you know, totally to be fair. Well, to me, at least I had been really intentional about putting all like using the G suite very heavily. Um, and so I was able basically to sort of spin everything up really quickly on my son's laptop the next day and, and like more or less replace that without oh, good. a huge amount of disruption from that perspective. But I, what I was going to say with all of that is the thing, one of the things that made me so mad about this situation is I was like, what are they going to do with, I mean, yes, my used laptop, my used laptop is so much more valuable to me than it is to anyone else. Yeah. Like maybe they resold it for a few hundred dollars, right? I happened to have bought, it was kind of a nice one. So I bought it for like 1500. Um, but I would have paid much more to get it back. But my whole point in saying that is some stupid thief is going to come and rip out your imp- on-prem servers, not even because they hate you or hate your data, but just because they think they can resell it. Yeah. Right. And then you're hosed, right? It's yeah. not even with it's not even to steal steal your information. It's just because they think there's some street value of it, right? And, yeah. and you're hosed. Um so anyway, you know, figuring out your your cloud strategy is 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 pretty interesting. I think there's also a whole interesting discussion, and I'm probably not the best person to to sort of lead this, but I'll just sort of flag it and leave it there is like 
how do you monitor productivity? Um, I think that's a super interesting question. And I know I've heard some lawyers and some businesses reflecting on like, what does it look like to, to monitor productivity in this new work from home environment, right? You've got to have a lot of trust in your employees, but you've also got to have a lot of accountability because yeah. if like stuff's not getting done, that's, that's your business has got to go on. Uh, and so figuring out whether like you've got the right butts in the seats, yeah, this is going to be a really interesting test of that. I think it's interesting because it, it, it really, I think clarifies for, it will clarify who can you truly give autonomy to and still see the, the work product from. And I think, you know, more like many more traditional industries, I think law firms have found solace in the fact that butts are in seats and they're there from this hour to this hour. So we're seeing quote unquote productivity and moving to this, this new world that again, might've taken a decade or two decades to get to where all of a sudden we're saying you're working from home. You're trusted to get your work done. You're measured by your output. You're not measured by the hours you put in. That's a new reality overnight. And that's, that's, I think, uh, a really challenging environment for law firms to um, to to lean into. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, but the ones that that survive and the ones that thrive, I think, will will need to to get there. But uh, and, um, and it it begins to paint. Sorry, not to interrupt you, but it begins to paint such an interesting picture for what these firms when when everything goes quote unquote back to normal. Right. Right. Do we begin to say like you know what? Betty is way more productive at home, like way more productive. So do we begin to create a more flexible work environment for that? Like, do we begin to create roles and responsibilities so what's, what, that what's are your, not location dependent? What's your opinion on that? You know, when we, when we get on the other side of this and I'll, I'll, I'll provide a bit more yeah. context to the question I'm asking here, which is, you know, on the other side of this crisis, you know, number one, what changes do you think the law firms that have not just survived, but maybe are even thriving in this environment, what have they made? What have they implemented? And, and will those be enduring changes to the way the, the law firms want run and, and, and what permanent chain impacts to the profession do you think we're going to see? Yeah. So let's see again, tackling the, trying to tackle the first question first. Um, I think, you know, like really deep convictions get born out of these kinds of uh, kind of really trying experiences, right? And in my opinion, the types of businesses, at least to me, that are the most interesting, they may not be the most successful, but the most interesting are those that have this deep abiding conviction about who they are. And even sometimes like this really core founding story, right? About how they operate and how they think. And I think the law firms that um, that either validated some really key assumptions about their business model through this experience or for whom this was like a real trial by fire and who completely rethought the way they think about their work and their business are are because i can't believe that on the other end of this as we again move into an increasingly globalized increasingly flexible increasingly communicative increasingly open <clears throat> Uh, uh, ecosystem and an economy that a a business that insists upon people coming to one fixed place to do a specific type of work on a certain type of uh, machine at a certain time, like that that I just don't think that fits with our our broader um, kind of direction as a society and economy today. But then layer on top of that, all of the potential benefits you can get by leveraging distribution and leveraging technology um like that's i think where things get really interesting so again i think i think the folks who are going to emerge from this more powerful or, or stronger or better off are those who for whom this either becomes like a really sort of pivotal moment in their existence right and and they're sort of like the 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 switch is flipped um or or those who were like we got this and not only do we got this but like we're all over this, right? Yeah. We're, we're looking for opportunities. We're, you know, again, one of the examples you were, you asked me about Avo and again, I've stayed so high level, but like 
I have, uh, I have, I've had a client that relies really heavily on AdWords. And I think what AdWords must be doing right now, like some of the fluctuations that must, they must be seeing in search engine marketing have got to be just fascinating. And I've got to believe there are some really interesting opportunities out there to like get to the top of a really interesting search and begin to establish yourself as, you know, certain people decrease their marketing budgets, as certain people reevaluate, like it's got to be changing. And so that's just like one really interesting example where I think law firms could be looking for opportunity. Yeah. And and, and let's, let's pick up that thread and, and pull at it a little bit on the, on the client acquisition side, much of our, our discussion at this point has focused on how do law firms operate going forward in this new environment, kind of from a executing on their, their, their business, serving their existing clients and so on. When you, when you back up and start thinking about the client acquisition, how do I, and this is something I think many law firms will start thinking about as soon as they figure out how do I service my existing clients, which is how do I go out and acquire new clients in this new environment? And for, for some lawyers, if you're, if your biz dev was going out to that chamber of commerce mixer and picking up some new clients, that's off the table for the foreseeable future. Um, and many of the other kinds of networking and word of mouth kinds of, uh, aspects of, of business development for lawyer, lawyers just dropped off a cliff. How do you think, and I, I think your experience at, at Avo, which for those of our listeners that aren't familiar with that, was a marketplace that helped connect consumers with lawyers. What, what perspective do you have from your, your experience at Avo and, and beyond around the, what the new world of, of lead generation and, and client acquisition looks like? Yeah. And again, I'm always tempted to go to the high level, but I think I think I think that this moment, whether it no matter whether it change permanently changes us a lot or maybe modestly, is going to be a pivotal opportunity for some people to really change some hypotheses and some ideas about how they acquire clients. And so, I, again, I think this is a really interesting opportunity to be testing and and trying different things. I mean, there's there's a number of different ways that you can answer that question. Um, I, I, I do, I do think not to think like sort of too many steps ahead, but I've heard people st- already started kind of reflecting on like, um, online meeting and webinar fatigue, right? Like, uh, there's, there could be a world in which, you know, I don't want to jump on that virtual happy hour anymore. Right. I want something else. I want something new. Yeah. And so it's going to be, and, and, and I think. I don't know what the answers to those questions are. I'll give some suggestions, but I, I don't know what the, the answers to those questions are. But what I firmly believe, going back to the sort of the story that I was sharing a bit ago about um, the client that I was working for, where I sort of pushed through this and found an opportunity, I think that the the lawyers and law firms that are going to find the opportunities in this space are the ones who are going to be relentlessly experimenting and relentlessly trying new things because the old playbook isn't going to work anymore. And I, I, I'm not, I think there will come a time, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it could be, it could be real. I, I, I keep, I, I keep sort of joking <laughs> and I have a podcast and you have a podcast. I keep wondering when we're going to hit peak podcast and I don't, yeah. I don't know that we've hit it yet. Cause I keep consuming all kinds of different, you know, p- podcasts. So maybe, maybe we don't reach peak content, but you know, the folks who are going to emerge are the folks with the most interesting voices. The folks who are going to emerge are the folks who are connecting with you in that way that you least expected. The folks who are going to emerge are the folks who like know how to communicate with you that much more effectively than the last person. Um, And so it's, it's hard to say because I think, I think consumer changes or consumer tastes change so frequently that it's, it's hard to know, like, it's hard for me to say like, oh, you should be doing webinars or SEM is the way or, but I mean, surely understanding how to tap in to the kind of cultural zeitgeist that we're all experiencing and penetrate the noise and talk to people. Like there are more tools to do that than ever, more time to do that than ever. And people have more time than they have had to be communicated with than ever. And so the way that you're able to do that, like whatever that tool is, um, I think is those are going to be the folks who, and, and it may be some combination of them, right? It could be a podcast that gets promoted via SEM. It could be your Twitter meetups. It could be, 
you know, whatever you're, I don't, I don't spend enough time on Instagram, but I'm sure there's an analogy there or Snapchat or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and again, I, 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 it's hard for me to give specifics because the, the answers will come in kind of the doing and the experimenting. Um, but, but though, like I also, and obviously like just to state the obvious, right. And, and, and I've thought about this too, and this is obviously super applicable to Clio, but like, you're also going to just from a practical standpoint, have to figure out customer acquisition in a world in which it doesn't make sense for them to physically come into your office. So yeah. like electronic signatures is like the, the, the like table stakes. Yeah. But like, how do you get a will witnessed today? Yeah. Um, how, and I actually, again, I was on a webinar the other day and heard a woman talking about basically saying like, they don't recognize uh, elect- electronic notarizations in my jurisdiction but I don't want to skip. I, I don't want. I don't want to stop serving my clients who need estate plans. So like, I'm gonna get stuff e notarized, and like, I'm gonna let them fight me about it. Um, yeah. And so like, those are the kinds of things and the boundaries that are gonna have to be pushed, and the kind of challenges that are gonna have to the, the fights that are gonna have to be fought in order for people to continue to grow and expand and take advantage of these opportunities. I, I think one of the things I've heard you say over the course of this podcast, Dan, that I find, you know, hugely motiv- motivating and, and exciting is this idea that there's permission to experiment right now as well. Like when you, when you look at, at the, the macro environment we're in, if you start doing things differently it's so easily explained by the fact that you're just adapting to this new environment and and many changes that lawyers would have been terrified to have made you know, in a any given week in 2019 all of a sudden they've got permission to do this week in 2020 and i, I think even when you look at making some of these moves that that you, you just need to find a way of getting things done you need to find a way of getting uh, something notarized that doesn't involve bringing a passport and an ID to a notary and getting within t- two feet of them to, right. to get that stamp. Um, it's it's permission for the uh, the entire industry to to innovate, and I think I think clients are going to be really receptive to that. Uh, Dan, our our conversation has been amazing. We're we're running low on time, but I want to conclude with. A couple of final questions. The first is, let's talk about getting paid. Uh, and and I, I know you're, I think it's going to be front of mind in terms of, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is, I think, the most foundational piece that a lot of lawyers are thinking about. How do I put food on my family's table? How do I, how do I get paid? What does payment look like in this new era? Um, I know you're affiliated with a, a legal payments company, Gravity Legal, um, do you have anything to share in terms of your perspective on what changes this crisis is driving in, in the payments industry in general? And if you have any specific opinions on what lawyers can be doing to ensure they're getting uh, getting paid and to ensure that they're they're keeping cash flow uh, cash flowing in their firm, which which is going to be, I think, the difference between a lot of firms surviving and some shuttering through the course of this crisis. Yeah, no, happy to happy to take that softball. Um, but it's it's great because I actually we we talked to a firm just a week ago um who said uh I am locked out of my office or my PO box and I only get paid by check. And like I could get paid, but my clients are sending me checks. So I'm like my my business could continue except for the fact that I'm taking physical payment. Of, right for my services. So like to me that was like the prime example of at least through this crisis and potentially because at some point in the future you may not be able to accept a personal check for whatever reason, not because right. of the zombie apocalypse, but maybe you're on vacation, who knows. That convenience of enabling yourself to get paid electronically is like a no-brainer. Um and then I, you know, shout out to the Clio Trends Report. Uh, you folks for a number of years have been talking about how electronic payments result in higher collections. So yeah. like, and, and, I mean, and like significantly higher collections. Uh, it's the difference sometimes of of even 10 or 20%. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's in, in, in lean times, <laughs> you know, if you're a million dollar firm, that's $200,000. Yeah. So yeah. like that's, that's not chump change. Like that's, that's, that's real money. 
Um, another great shout out again. I, I know you, you, you toss this softball to me, but I'm going to, I'm going to toss a bunch back, right? At I'll, you guys. I'll take it. Yeah. The, the 2017 Clio trends report, um, talks about how, uh, attorneys who use their trust account, uh, get paid. Uh, I think it was, uh, either it's collections are 15% higher, or I'm not going to get the numbers, but it's like 15 to 18% um, better. Yeah. I think uh, it was the, revenue the recognition. Yeah. The collection rate, uh, was, was 15 or 20% higher. And, and again, just to give a quick shout out to what we're doing at Gravity Legal, that's one of the pieces that we're most focused on is how to make it easier and, and kind of more comfortable for attorneys to, to use their trust accounts because it's better for attorneys. It's better for clients. Um, and, and frankly, again, they make more money. So like, that's another huge piece. That's, and that's another thing I would encourage attorneys to think about is if you've got a huge chunk of money in your trust account right now, I would highly recommend that you begin to start working against that money. Um, if, again, provided that it's consistent with your ethical duties, right? Not wasting clients' money. But if you've got work to be done and it's just sitting there, don't look at that as some kind of cushion because the, the, the client could change their mind at some point and want that money back. And so if you've got work to do and the client's expecting you to do it, like start work, start working against that money because that's that's a great way to um, to keep money flowing in while you're you know, pivoting and trying new. Yeah. Uh, and just to, to, to layer in another pro tip I got from yeah. Aaron Levine, who was on the podcast last week. Yeah. I saw you guys. She, yeah. Yeah. It was great. And and her, her tip was she's got evergreen retainers with a number of, of clients and just ask, normally she would exhaust it and then ask for a top up. But even if it's partially exhausted, going to your clients saying, do you mind topping up your retainer to help cash flow? And yep. she found an un- unbelievable willingness of her her clients. And this is goodwill that you've obviously earned over time. But if you've earned that goodwill, know that many of your clients are looking for a way of supporting you and your firm. Uh, and and again, if that's just a matter of hitting a credit card, I think another great example is payment plans, right? If you can yep. institute some kind of a payment policy uh, that that might split you know, a $5,000 payment that's a big chunk at once into five $1,000 payments over five months, make it digestible for your clients and you can achieve, you know, something that, that helps you bridge that cash flow gap and getting paid over time is better than getting paid, not getting not paid at, at all. all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just going to just one other quick, so no, total, and the other sort of dovetailing off of what you were saying, um, I, I, these are kind of an emerging idea, but I'm a big fan of uh, subscription plans, right? Yes. Like, if you if you are providing sort of a minimum level of service to a client with the opportunity for them to either you know have you uh, on call for them or have you available uh, for more services or you know a discount on additional services, again to your point, way easier to ask them for a hundred or two hundred or five hundred dollars a month on an ongoing basis where you've got ten of those and you've already got a nice nut coming in month yeah. over month, and it's not it's not a matter of finding another five thousand dollar client. It's a matter of whether or not that sort of, you know, minimum five hundred dollar uh, subscription fee is too much for ten of your clients to swallow. Um, yeah, I think the be... the panacea there is: can you get seventy or eighty percent of your monthly revenues secured through payments? And it's doable, right? There's uh, Kim Bennett; her law firm is a great example, I think, of of one that's been able to build a huge base of revenue just from the subscription business. Totally. Um, and then the one other just sort of payments hack I was going to suggest to folks is uh, there are some states that do permit you. And I know I've talked with folks at Clio and you guys are a little on the fence about this, but I just want to toss it out as an option. There are some states that do permit you to um, pass the fee of the credit card um, or processing along to your clients. Yeah. Um, and just to give some context there, the consumer advocates have actually been fighting with credit card companies for years to get those numbers disclosed to to customers because credit card companies don't want you to know how much it costs you to yeah. get your mile, miles every right. year. And, and right. all, all we're saying is we're not saying that lawyers should pass those fees along. All we're saying is you can provide the option to your, to your client to know what it costs to use an e-check or an ACH versus a credit card and then let them make the decision. And yeah. we've actually found that um, the research that, that Gravity Payments has done suggests that that um, consumers don't re- you don't pay all that less often with a credit card, even when faced with the prospect of eating that fee. But again, that's like that can be a pretty significant margin, for which, which shows you what a convenience premium there is there, right? I, I, I think that's that's maybe the biggest, the strongest I, signal you could hope for. 
I don't know if I'm the only one who, I mean, I don't do this all the time, but I will, you know, I'll eat the whatever, like $5 fee for using an ATM that's not my banks, you know, like every so often just because I need cash, right? Like rational people do this. Yeah. At least, I don't know, maybe you don't think I'm rational, but I think I'm relatively rational. Um, so, so that's another way, but there, you know, there are lots of different ways to, to, to think about it, but those are a few suggestions that I, I think, uh, folks should, should keep in mind as they try to try to weather this, uh, certainly uncertain landscape. Yeah. And, um, before we wrap up, Dan, just wanted to number one, acknowledge and, and thank you for your tremendous efforts in, in tracking some of the legal relief efforts that, uh, are underway via your, your Twitter account. Uh, and was curious if, if there was any of those relief efforts you wanted to call special attention to. Is there anything you'd point uh, listeners to to, uh, to to get relief and to, to understand way, resources that might be out there uh, that can help them? Well, we, we so again, the folks at, at Gravity Legal and I have put together a list. Um, you can find it on our blog, gravity-legal.com slash financially legal. That's uh, our blog. It also happens to be the name of my podcast. There you can find um, a list, uh, one of our blog posts, uh, a list of COVID-19 resources for small businesses, including law firms. Law firms are small businesses. Um, we did just recently add the the uh, the Clio contribution. Uh, oh, we thank you. We got that on the, over the weekend, yeah. so that's on there. To be honest, we've been so busy aggregating them that I have not had a chance to dig in in any great d- depth. There are now 60 programs out on, on there, um, and we've stopped updating them because I think there are so many, but maybe we'll do maybe once a week and keep adding it. But there are programs, both national and state specific, um, private, public. Um, there, there are a, a wide range. Um, and again, I, we actually entertain the notion of sort of digging in on those and trying to you know, offer some kind of recommendation. But it's so firm specific. It's so business yeah. specific yeah. that we felt like it was just better to give folks a, one place to go for most of that information. Well, I think creating the resource in the first there. place is a, a huge contribution to uh, to the effort. So, so thank you for for doing that, and thank you to uh, to Gravity Payments for doing that. Um, to close out, Dan, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, final question: If you were to think of one takeaway, one call to action that you wanted to share with uh, the listeners, you know, either as, as legal professionals or just as as human beings, what would that that takeaway be as we we navigate this crisis? Take a deep breath. I I uh, I I was into mindfulness a little more a few years ago. I don't spend as much time now, um, but I I really really believe in the power. Like even in that in the moment of just like. And it does take some practice. It does take a little bit of understanding how kind of that that action can can help you kind of orient. But that would I mean, it's it's good when you're facing big decisions and challenges. It's good when you're about to fly off the handle with your kids. Um, it models good behavior both for them and everyone around you. Um, like and and it's physiologically proven that like getting more oxygen to your brain helps you think more rationally. Yeah. And so I think both in the in the short term, in the medium term and in the long term, if we can just like sort of remember to take that pause, take that breath and then sort of think about how we're going to proceed, I think that will be the most powerful and meaningful way that we can deal with both the challenges and the opportunities we face. That's a, a great note to end on. Thanks so much for joining us, Dan. It's been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, uh, always a pleasure, Jack. I wish we had more time personally. <laughs> well, well, we'll need to circle back to you. I, I think we uh, uh, we definitely have some some great questions to come back to, and I'd love to dig into uh, your perspective on those with um, uh, with a bit more time to to process what's going on. Um, but but thank you again for for joining us, Dan. And to the listeners, thank you for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider, for supporting this podcast. 
If you'd like to learn more about Clio, please visit Clio.com. And for more resources to help lawyers navigate the challenges of COVID-19, please visit Clio.com slash COVID-relief.